Okay, so we are on page 52, I think. This is, it. This is the end. Oh, yeah, because it's tucked. Oh, yeah. Well, let's first, before we do the next piece, let's struggle for a second. You want to struggle for a second? The prohibition. The prohibition of. Last week we spoke about, remember, shaking a lady's hand? We said that because it's a biblical prohibition, so vote habriot to honor for yourself or for somebody else doesn't push that off. Remember we it's spoke about it. It's not a rabbinic prohibition. It's a biblical prohibition. Shaking a lady's hand. Um, again, we mentioned that there's this concept of kvot habriot, meaning if you need to go to the bathroom and you can't find a place to go, you're looking for somewhere to go, you're allowed to hold it in until you find somewhere to go. Why? Maybe you should just go in the middle of the street. It's a biblical prohibition to hold it in. It's not so yet. Because of kvod habriot, for a person to have their own respect, self-dignity, is also an important thing. And we said that you can't use that rule everywhere, because there are things that are more important than kvod habriot, like not shaking somebody's hand. So let me ask you a question. Why can you... What's the prohibition? What are we violating when we hold in from going to the bathroom? Baal What does Baal What does Baal mean? How do we translate that? That pro- why why can you not hold it in? We said there was a prohibition. Do not it may damage yourself. Do not defile yourself. Don't become an abomination. Right? That's what we said. So that's also a biblical prohibition. So maybe in the middle of the street we're supposed to pull our pants down and go to the bathroom. How can we can say kvod habriot, uh, self dignity doesn't well, allow? You have to. You only would damage yourself if you hold it in for too long. So. Yeah. Okay. But but it's a biblical prohibition. You can't hold it in. That right? That's what it says. Baal tashak too. Prohibition is don't they get damaged? Yeah. And before damage, it no, that's take a one hour before it. But that's a different prohibition, though. We're not saying don't damage yourself. That's not what the prohibition says. About the shatsu, don't defile yourself. Don't don't make yourself disgusting. Remember we're on page. <laughs> on page forty. Nine. Hello, hello. Hi. Thank you. Oh, you're here. Mother Where else would I be? <laughs> <laughs> On page 49. Remember we said that you can't hold it in. Why? Because you violated prohibition. You see the halakha briar? On page 49. Who remembers what it says there? You can't hold in going to the bathroom because you violated prohibition of Baal Teshatut Nefadachem. Do not make yourself an abomination. Do not defile yourself. If that's true, that if your, that's true, just bowels or your so it says here both, oh. both. The Rambam adds that if you would to hold in just a urinal movement, there's actually an extra prohibition. He holds it, it might be worse. Um, okay, for health, yeah. I- interestingly enough, we say that, okay, so you can't find a bathroom yet, you can hold it in. But who said? Who said that self-dignity counts? This is a biblical prohibition. Like shaking a woman's head? I'll, tell you, I'll give you a hint that I'm, I'm lying to you. Maybe you are a doctor. What? You are a practice medicines. Okay, well... But I, I'm, I'm giving you a hint. I'm lying to you. Look at 49. Does anyone remember what we said here in 49? I mean, when we go to this bizarre party, it's usually by the severity of the punishment that we usually go by a hierarchy. Very nice. It's true. We do do such a thing. Uh, here, because there's no punishment for... <laughs> Lack of self dignity, you're going here by what's more severe, what's biblical, what's rabbinic. What's biblical here is not going to the bathroom. Mm. Or is it? Yeah, but what I mean, it's uh, not immediate. Uh, defiling yourself. You're still you're assuming that it's wait. because of danger. Yeah. Zev is right, the definition has nothing to do with oh, danger. Right. So this has to do with an abomination. If you're going in the middle of the street, you're defiling yourself. Oh, this yeah, is a nice. Yeah, that, that's yeah, also yeah, defiling yeah, yourself. It's a, a different way. The different yeah, thing. It's, it says like yeah. you should go outside of the camp and dig a hole. Yeah. There's a way to do it, but you still have to do it. So I, I, I like what you're saying, but halakhically it doesn't hold water because they're not, they're not compatible. <laughs> okay. It doesn't um, hold water, and you shouldn't hold your water. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so tell me, I'm lying to you, a little bit. 
Look on page 49 in the Bir Halakha. Let's read it together. Page 49 in the middle of the page where it says Ted Vav. It's not where we are, but that's where we're going to be answering our question. Hamishahen Nekavav. One who holds back from going to the bathroom. Benek Donim, Benek Tanim, whether for big or small bathroom uses. Over is he violates the prohibition Mishum of Al Teshaktu et Nafshodechem. Do not defile your souls, don't make yourself an abomination, however you like to translate them. V'yesh amrim, some say, Shehu isur min ha-Torah, that it's actually a biblical prohibition. V'yesh amrim, some say, She'ein o'ela, it is only an isur de Rabbanan, a rabbinic prohibition. How could it be a rabbinic prohibition if it's mentioned in the Torah? How you interpret? Explain. Well, they derive In other words, the law you from can, it. Is it with, with how you understand the Torah about the abomination? So you're saying, and I'm going to read into what you're saying a little bit. Mm-hmm. When the Torah says "bal tishaktu," it wasn't necessarily referring to holding in going to the bathroom. Some rabbis say it was. Some rabbis say no. It wasn't referring to that. But we're including not going to the bathroom into this prohibition because they're seemingly similar. And that would only be a rabbinic prohibition. And because that's only a rabbinic prohibition, now answer our question. So now, Kavot counts. Very nice. Now, Kavot Abriyot is worth something. Self-dignity is worth something, because that trumps a rabbinic mitzvah. Ah, uh, so what do you do if you're one of the rabbis who hold it's a biblical prohibition? You have to find another biblical prohibition to... <laughs> You would have to look somewhere down that road. Yeah. Our modern views are different. Like, I've read halachot and sefer barachot where, you know, if you're diving in a shul and you see excrement, you should just move back four amot, right? Or so many feet from it and then say your Shimon Esrei. So you would assume that it was a lot looser about human, you could say, defilement in those days. So let's, let's zev on to something. Let's look at it together. Let me go back to page 51. At the bottom of the page. You see Yud Dalid? There's a bl- last two lines of the page. There's a Yud Dalid. You see that? Bottom, bottom. In the Berur Halakha. In the Berur Halakha. Yud Dalid. See that? Yud Dalid. Second to last line on the bottom of the page. Ken Ketav a Primagadim. The Primagadim says this as well. What does he say? Shekevan shehu medarabanan, because the prohibition is only a rabbinic, rabbinic prohibition. Lachen nidche, because of that, it's pushed off mipnei kvod habriot, because of kvod habriot, because of self dignity. Kagon nehamtim, like waiting, ad shimtza, until he finds makom tsanua, a, a private oh, place to go to the bathroom. This opinion. Is codified into halacha for the first time. Huvala halacha ba Mishnah Bura in the book Mishnah Bura written by Chavetz Chaim. Very nice, very nice. The Chavetz Chaim. Yeah, he's the first person to write this halacha, as well as the Aruch Hashulchan. Who's the Aruch Hashulchan? David, the son of Rabbi Yosef. No, no, no. It's close. It was, you think it would be that way. Uh, Epstein. Very nice. Oh, very good. Epstein. Oh. Epstein. Okay. Very good. Close. 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 Rabbi Yechiel Michal Halevi Epstein. He was, like we told you, from a Moroccan family of Ben Benishti, who immigrated to Poland many hundreds of years before and became one of the prominent rabbinic Ashkenazi families in Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so many works of halakha and commentaries on the Torah are written by this family as Ashkenazi works. But very interestingly, they do have a leaning towards Sephardic, um, not halakha, because they view themselves as Ashkenazim, but there's something more familiar in that writing style to us than some other books. So the Aruch HaShulchan and the Mishnah Boah, so it says, V'huva l'halakha, this is quoted l'halakha. What's quoted l'halakha? So what is, what, what the opinion? opinion? The opinion that? You shouldn't go back. That... That's no, 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 all the way around. It's that that you can't you should. Should. Defile yourself is taken. You should find a private place. It means that you, you shouldn't go. Uh, hold back. No, no, no. Here, here, the, the Prima Gadim is holding 
that it's a darabanan. So from here we're learning that you can hold it in if you don't have a place to go to the bathroom. This opinion is mentioned la halacha as a halacha ba mishnah bua. In here, u va'aruch. Turn the page. Hashulchan, and then the book the aruch hashulchan. The ayin ba magen Abraham. We're in the. 52 in the in the middle of the page on the right column. See that in the middle of the page on the right column. The ayin look by Magen Avraham the writings of the Magen Avraham on the Shulchan Aruch. Dilak tanim that in order to urinate, tanim are small ones. Mutar it is permissible. Afilu bayom even in the middle of the day. Bifnei rabim in front of people. Why? Mishum deika sakana because it's dangerous. It's dangerous to hold in urine, and therefore that violates all kinds of things, and therefore a person is allowed to urinate in the middle of the day in front of people, because it's more important that they should urinate than it is that they should hold it in and find a private place. I don't think people hold in that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, he's risking his life. Why? Somebody Here? can come and beat him or, or kill him or whatever. For doing that in public? Sure, in the middle of the street, if somebody, you know, starts urinating. <laughs> so well, you have to follow. Say, hey, what you are you doing? We have to yeah. follow public laws. Yeah, I mean, today they'd be arrested, right? Yeah. Even in Muslim lands, they would probably be arrested. Yeah, really. I, I no. Like no. Or no. Yeah, for sure. I, I would, would be such a guy. You would be such a guy. If I would walk with my kids <laughs> and somebody will start urinating in the middle of the street, I will be. Sure. <laughs> I don't. I don't think that's true. I think that they do allow urination in. Arab countries. I had a friend who lived in Afghanistan for a few years, and she would picked up the habit of spitting openly and uh, you know find bushes and urinating. Spitting, by the way, is a Jewish tradition to not spit publicly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're the first people to make that a, a Jewish norm. Someone who spits in front of other people, mm-hmm. the rabbis have some very harsh words for him. Mm-hmm. Loses chelik and all, all kinds of things <laughs> like that. Like not uh, it's not a nice. Thing. What? It's a Aside from hazard. public health, it's disgusting. Yeah, and anything that's you true. do that's disgusting to someone else is prohibited. A rabbi's right, it's prohibited to spit in front of another human being. This is halakha. It's brought down in Shulchan Aruch. There's no ifs and buts around it. No, halakha. But, urinating, it seems to be that at least according to the Magen Avraham, the danger involved in not going is more important than violating the laws of modesty, which is going in public. Now, you're right. So today you can't, like, you know, pull down your pants. It would be public, uh, what they call it, public nudity, and all kinds of things like you that. You go in the bushes yeah. or the side of the road or something. Mm-hmm. Oh, so it could be Zev's giving an... You know, it's the side of the freeway. It's the bushes. Technically, if someone drove by, they could see you. But that's not prohibited. Mm-hmm. You don't have to wait until you find a bathroom with the bathroom stall. By the way, it's probably because of this opinion that urinals are allowed in the mm-hmm. Because technically, urinating is... And someone's looking. They're not looking at you, mamash, but they see you urinating. It's not the end of the world. At least not according to the Magen Avram. V'chein katvu ha-Mishnah Bura. The Mishnah Bura agrees... With the Magen Avraham. The Ha'ben Ishchai, the Ben Ishchai also agrees with them. The Ben Ishchai, the Magen Avraham, the Mishnah Bura say that urinating is more important than waiting for a place to go, and therefore, just do it in public. My God, they won't allow you to go to the bathroom any place. Where? Restaurants are places, bathroom available. Unless you, you take, buy something, they won't allow you. But unless you're a customer of the restaurant. Buy something. It's like a little bit of snow. A little bit is dumb. Like, I get it. I understand why they do it. Yeah. But uh, it, it's, it. <laughs> it's still, you have to pay someone to clean it, to upkeep it, the water cut. In a place still, where there are homeless, like Santa Monica, mm. it's understandable because it's. Right, but it's still a little bit is dumb. Mm-hmm. The bathroom yeah. is still like one they of those basic be humans. Well, they have public restrooms. I'll tell you, when I was in, uh, York York there was a place I was once in, and they had a, a central bus station, and they charge you mm-hmm. to go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. You have to pay to go. You don't have, and if you don't have the right change, they don't have change for you. So, in Europe, they do that. In yeah. Europe, yeah, they do that. Yeah, right. yeah. For me, that's a very, uh, I don't know, I don't appreciate it. Not, not according to Halakha. We believe going to the bathroom is very urgent and very important, and you shouldn't have to be doing something first to get in. In Italy, when I was there, they let you go to the bathroom for free, mm-hmm. but they charge you for toilet paper. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, Mexico, Mexico is the same. same thing? Yeah. So, yeah, sure, you can go, but if you want toilet, you have to pay per, like, I don't know, per, I don't know how they charge you, I don't know, but they prorate it. I don't know, I don't know how it is that they do it, but, um, you 
I don't know. I don't know if you, what would happen if you did, but that seems to be their style. Like that's like real. That's like real stuff. That's like come, go, but then uh, then you got to go. you You're in trouble. Okay. Um, that's the nice thing of traveling with babies. BYO, bring your own. <laughs> so what about women? Yeah. Woman and snoot. Is snoot more important than this or? Snoot you know, you know, you're asking a good question. I'll tell, you, tell me why he's asking a good question. But didn't we study something because that says you shouldn't even reach this point? That you should yeah. go even before you. Yes, of course. You I mean, you should, you should try to reach this point where you go before. But we're talking about a situation where you didn't, okay. or this happens to you suddenly for whatever reason. But Moshe Chaim asked a good question. What about for ladies? Is he specifying here men or women? No. Could you say that perhaps he's only talking about men? Yes. Be. Yeah. Could you say that he's, because in that differentiating, it would apply to everybody? What's the difference? Yeah. Dangerous for a man, dangerous for a woman. Yeah. yeah. Abram's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't have a good answer to your question. So is uh, women... Sanyut prohibitions for women are more important than for men? Or are there different... Well, let's, let me try. This has no basis in halakha, but a basis in logic. If it's okay to urinate in public, then why is going to the bathroom worse than urinating? Because you have to expose more. You have to expose more. If you have to expose more, then possibly for a woman, it's prohibited to urinate in public just like it is for a man to defecate in public because they're exposing in the same fashion. Could it be? Um, no. Because a woman can keep herself covered and urinate. Okay. The, uh, she can squat down, be covered, and urinate. So this is an, uh, we'd have to uh, ask. Bowel movement? No, can't. We'd have to look into the halacha. Mm -hmm. We have to look into the halacha. It's a great question. Don't let me forget about it. We'll look into it. Let's see further. Va'ayen bivchorot. Look in the Talmud and bivchorot. That's one of the tractates of the Talmud. Mashtinim ma'im. We urinate water, meaning urinate bifnei rabim. In front of uh, the public. Uh, oh, I got it, I got it. Okay. Okay. The Rosh writes, who's the Rosh, remember? The Rabbeinu, mm -hmm. Rabbeinu. Asher. Asher, very nice, he's one of the three pillars of Halakha that Rabbi Yosef Cairo follows. The Katav HaRosh, the Rosh writes, we're now six lines down. The Biktanim, that regarding urination, Leika Mishum Kvod HaBriot Klam. There is no problem of self-dignity because I guess people do it all the time. Like Zev is saying, that perhaps the societal norms have changed. The Shechein Katav, and it was written similarly by Rabbeinu Yehuda al Barcelona. Someone give me a guess where he comes from. Barcelona. There you go. He's from Barcelona. It seems to be Rabbi Yehuda of Barcelona agrees with the Rosh that urinating in public is not a lack of dignity. Says Rabbi David Yosef, Ulam, but Bismanenu, nowadays, in our times, makpidim bazem od. People are very, very careful about this. Shalola asot ken, not to do this at all. People don't urinate in front of anybody. We have public bathrooms. Right, but you could say that there's a difference between urinating in a bathroom, even though someone could see you there, than on the side of the street doing the same exact thing. Well, for one, it breaks the law of the land. Well, yeah, yeah, well, that's for sure. I mean, we're not here advocating whether it's okay legally or not. We're just halachically. Halachically, what's the, uh, le what's the difference between standing up in the bathroom and urinating people see you and standing up in the side of the street? They're both in public, technically. I think in the olden days, streets were dirt. Most people mm -hmm. lived on the yeah. farm. You, you weren't like in a city of cement. Right. I had this happen to a student of mine. Yeah, it wasn't really a student of mine. He learned somewhere that I was giving a, like a weekly class at, and uh, he was, he got drunk, you know, you know, Purim, whatever they do, mm -hmm. the fools, and he went, it was in Yerushalayim, and he went to some restaurant and pulled down his pants and started going on their window. <laughs> like, imagine what looks like a guy with a kippah, a tzitzit, mm -hmm. he's drunk and urinating on a window. Mm -hmm. See, I, 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 one day I might write a book. 101 reasons why not to get drunk on Purim. This is like uh, reason number two, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but technically, I mean, and there are still countries like this where people urinate on the side of the road all the time. But not on the window. 
Not in a window. No, of course not. <laughs> Just on the side of the road. It's a major health problem in India because it's like a in northern India. It's like a cultural mindset that it's actually a good idea to uh, because they defecate don't have public in public. Bathrooms. Same but, problem. But there's, I, I read that they also have like a there's there's kind of like a, a mindset that it's like there's something kind of beautiful about going out in the. That's in the. Uh, do you like when Americans write articles about cultures they don't know? Well, I might not be. No, it's from. Uh, uh, India says they're going to be they're going to be building one public toilet per second over the next couple really? of years. Yeah. Yeah. Major really? Because it's a big because there's just, is that, is that a big problem. Because huge yeah. health problems like they they got a lower birth weight than the Muslim people who don't urinate in public and defecate in public. They got like open toilets. And, Interesting. Um, so so this is yeah. oh, okay. So it could be that there were places where this was the common norm, and that's where these rabbis are coming from. Muslim people have over Friday, Bishud Rabim, especially publicly. Rev Rev David says today publicly. People are very careful not to urinate. Umatzinu, and therefore we find the shayach tzniut afliktanim. That tzniut is relevant in regards to urination. Uche deita bivamot, like we find in the Talmud in Divamot, of a perush Rashi Sham, and like Rashi says over there. Okay. So we don't have to finish the rest of this piece. According to those who hold that it's a biblical prohibition, they're in trouble. They're in trouble. But it doesn't seem like we, or the majority of the poskim, agree that it's a biblical prohibition. Rather, it's a rabbinic prohibition based on a biblical prohibition, and therefore the problem doesn't exist so much as you're allowed to hold it in if you are looking actively for a bathroom. Where did the Rambam hold it? The Rambam is found on... Page fifty. Because you always held in the you know in terms of health, you know, it was strict. Just one moment. Mm. The Rambam seems to agree that it's a rabbinic prohibition. Although the Maran isn't sure. Says the Rambam might be saying this way or might be saying that way. He's vague in regards to what he believes. But most of our posts can hold it's only a rabbinic prohibition. Rabbinic prohibition against urinating in public? No, against, it, against holding, it in. holding it in. Against holding it in. I don't know if this really relates to what we're discussing directly, okay. but I do know in uh, Sefer Adat of the Rambam, he recommends that a person should do whatever they can in terms of their bowels to make sure they're completely cleared out in the that there's no well, we mentioned this. Remember, we mentioned doing health. this in the morning. Yeah, person should check himself every morning to go to the bathroom. Right, right. and this take as much time as you need too. Right, right. I Meaning, it's more important to go to the bathroom than it is to make it a minute on time. Because then uh, you won't have a problem of where to go in public during the day if you're evacuated. Right, and right. And you, you should follow health laws to do that. So there should never be constipated. He says one should always be. And the, we do mention in the morning and the evening. Remember, that was uh, two times a person should make sure that they clear themselves out. And I, I said to him, when we learned this, it was very important for people who don't do it. They're rushing somewhere, they're going to work. Uh, don't ever push this off. It's worth being five minutes late somewhere. It's worth it. Um, and, and like I said, in our educational system, we have to change that. And You don't have to ask to go to the bathroom. It's a ridiculous notion. It's a it could affect you for years afterwards. Like, like I told you, I've had people in high school or... And you told people who were embarrassed about it. You know, or they had to rush out of the house in the morning and they waited till you know, mid-afternoon and it affected their whole system and This is a problem. 20, this is a years problem. Later. And uh, there are things that, again, our values have to be Jewish values. And you can do a lot more for Jewish education by teaching kids mm-hmm. that we value going to the bathroom. What's the value of saying you have to ask before you leave the classroom? Mm-hmm. What value does a kid, what is he going to do with the rest of his life with that, with that knowledge? Nothing. It doesn't help him for the rest of his life. <laughs> the rest of his life he's going to remember that his teacher valued person relieving themselves, taking care of their body, that's a value that will stay with them forever. I never heard, in all my years in yeshiva, I never heard of having to ask to go to the bed. Never. Only when I was here in school in San Diego. <laughs> and that is not a Jewish value. A... Bathroom passes and all kinds of stories like that. Like that. Unbelievable. So someone's in the bathroom. So, he so in Baltimore, to... you just kind of like 
kind of give like a little like a nod or something and out you go or you just, just like a little wave got up and walk out of the room walk, yeah, I mean most rabbis at the beginning of the year they give you their policy on drinking in class eating in class going to the bathroom in class everyone has a different thing but generally yeah you get up and you walk out listen if you do it every day and the class is an hour long and you're gone for 45 minutes someone will pull you over and say come on every day in this class this time it's like scheduled and so uh, they'll, they'll figure it out but un- unless there's no reason to worry about that so why why hold people back right it could be that two people didn't go to the bathroom at the same time. It could be. It could be that they both ditched and went for ice cream. You know, I mean, you never know. But, but uh, these things are important to instill in people. All right, let's do our last halacha of the chapter. Page 52, Nun Bet. 52 is an interesting number. I'll give you a dvartory about 52. It says in the Haggadah of Pesach, Rabbi Eliezer ben Arach, he says, I'm like a man of 70 years old, and I never merited to hear the redemption being said properly at night. I remember the famous, uh, famous part of the Haggadah. He was but he was 18 years old. So why does he say, I'm like 70 years old? The Rambam says that he was learning Torah very much. And when a person learns Torah, it makes them old. It makes them age. Uh, someone who's seriously dedicated to learning Torah happens to be very weak. Uh, our rabbis talk about this a lot. Even if they're physically fit, they're still... It's a spiritual and emotional exhaustion that they get from being uh, delving into such things all the time. Uh, and our the Rambam says that's why he felt like he was 70 years old. He had accomplished so much by the age of 18, he was like a 70-year-old man. The Arizal says something very interesting. What were you saying? The Arizal said oh, he didn't like that he, he was 18 years old, but he was a reincarnation of the Prophet Shmuel. The Prophet Shmuel passed away at what age? 52. 52 years old. 52 years old, and it's also known about Shmuel that he aged very quickly. And so when you find two character traits that are similar in a person, generally they link them, according to Kabbalah. And the Rizal seems to say that Shmuel and Avi aged young, so did Rabbi Eliezer that we're reading about in the Gemara. And therefore he says, I am like a man of 70 years old, meaning my soul has been in this world for 70 years. 52 years of Shmuel the Prophet, and 18 years as myself, and I still have never merited to hear this explanation until I heard it today. Mm-hmm. That's what it means, Kivan Shivim Shana. So that's the right for the number 52. Something you could hold on to. <coughs> the last halacha says, Rabbi David Yosef, Im If a person needs to go to the bathroom, Kodem Shinatali Yadav Shachrit, before he washes his hand in the morning. Again, let's, let's do this first, because we're going to get, next chapter we do, is how you wash your hands in the morning. I want to tell you this first. Someone tell me, from the moment you wake up, what's the order of waking up in the morning? How long? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you wake up, how long do you wait in bed until you wake up? Now we've done this part already. Well, you're supposed to, uh, before you totally stand up, you're supposed to recite more them. Well, before that. Okay. Roll to your side. Oh, 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 if you're, if you're, you don't if you're sit up not suddenly. dressed, you should. You don't sit up suddenly. You first give yourself, yes. a, wake up, yeah. wake up, and, and okay, slowly. good morning, mm-hmm. how's everyone doing? Get up, slowly. Right, when you get up, you do it in a fashion that you can be dressed. Most people sleep in clothes, so that's not really a, a halakha that they would worry about in this situation. Um, but if a person doesn't sleep in a new fashion, then yeah, they should have a way that when they wake up, uh, they are tenua. Um I once saw a guy who woke up, and when he woke up, he would get out of bed with a sheet on him. Okay. Uh, everyone has their own way to do it. They have a robe next to your bed. Whatever it is that you do. A person then says, Modani the Fanecha. Why is a person not to say Modani? They haven't washed their hands yet. Because it doesn't have a Shem's name. Because it doesn't have a Shem's name in it. So you're allowed to say it even though it's a religious thing because it doesn't have a Shem's name in it. Okay, what do you do next? <laughs> Washing your hands in the morning. Where do you wash your hands in the morning? Now, I know we're going to learn about this in the next chapter, so don't jump on me. So you see probably a lot of people have a basin by the bed. Because you can't walk a certain amount of feet until you do nita today. This halakha is not mentioned in the Gemara. It's not mentioned in the Rambam. It's not mentioned in the Shulchan Aruch. It's mentioned as a stringency. And by many poskim, uh, I know that our rabbis did not wash their hands in a basin by the bed. Uh, rather, they washed their hands in a sink or wherever they first found water. Mm-hmm. So assume, if you have the custom to wash it by your bed, okay, I'm not against it. It's just it's an extra stringency. If not... You walk to the sink, you wash your hands. How do you wash your hands? One, two, three, four, five, six. Right? 
Do you make a bracha? Yeah. No. After, no. After, no. After. No. no. Then you go to the toilet. You go to the bathroom. You go to the bathroom. Do whatever it is you need to do in the bathroom. Gedolim, ketanim, whatever it is that you do. You come out. You come out. And here our order slightly differs from the Shulchan Aruch. Interestingly enough. According to normative halakha, you do nitilat yadayim again. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then you make a bracha to wash your hands. You say it before Nikavim? No, after the toilet, it's supposed to be three and three. Yeah, once, what is it? No. Morning. Three, but alternated. What is it? Morning. 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 is uh, after Not sleep. Either. But after toilet, you do three and three. That's just for bread. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. From what I know, and it could be that I'm just keeping a tradition I had when I was a child, after you go, uh, whatever you do in the morning, you do one, 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 one. After that, you're right, you could do three. Yeah, first thing in the morning, that's the only thing different. But you wash your hands twice in the morning. What is uh, much I'm saying is in the morning, you wash your hands alternating, and then right after the bathroom, you go three and three. Okay, we'll see. That's the next section of Halakha. According to Halakha, you wash your hands, then you make a bracha, you continue a shereza, so on and so forth. According to our halachot, my halachot, Rabbi Peres' halachot, we wash our hands with soap, we make an am tilat yadayim, and then we wash our hands with a cup. That way we're also making the bracha before we wash our hands. Even though the Shukhan Aruch here is going to say, you make a bracha after you wash your hands. We'll talk about that when we get there, tomorrow night. Yeah, my, my guest heavily disagrees with that. What? My, my guest. Heavily disagrees with that. Yeah. It's okay, he can heavily disagree. Yeah. He's, but he's Ashkenaz. Well, he believes the Shulchan Rach said, well, the interesting thing is we're going to go over it. it. says that you wash and then you say the In the morning. Not when you wash your bread. I can believe Shulchan Rach said a lot of things, but he didn't say it. So yeah, you have to find where he said it. And you're good. Don't worry. You're on, you do it on the right. So, so we find, we find that that's the order of washing our hands. What if I can't wait to go to the bathroom? I can't wash my hands and then go to the I have to really go right now. I woke up and then go to the bathroom. Do you have to wash your hands right away? Or do you first go to the bathroom? You can go to the bathroom. So that's what it's right here. Yeah. If a person needs to go to the bathroom, before he washes his hands in the morning. He should first go to the bathroom. And then he should wash his hands. And even if, if he is uh, strict, to wash his hands, every morning, immediately when he wakes up, meaning at a basin by his bed, he should first go to the bathroom, and then he should wash his hands. Meaning, it's more important to go to the bathroom than it is to wash your hands first thing in the morning. Mm. Agree? Like yes. Okay. That's the order. What is it urgent? Yeah, he can't wait. Yeah. He, or if, or if, he, if he really needs wait, to go. Then you would wash your if hands. he can wait a second until he washes his hands, but some people, they, they wake up, they need to go to the bathroom. Go to the bathroom. Don't be extra holy. Don't, don't, we don't need... The holiness here would be to go to the bathroom, not to wash hands. And people think, for example, there's a famous story. Rabbi Chaim of Brisk. Whenever someone would come and ask them a question, I have a medical not me, someone had a medical issue, and they would say, I don't know if I should fast on Yom Kippur. And Rabbi Chaim of Brisk would always say, don't fast. So someone once came to Rabbi Chaim of Brisk and complained to him, said, I don't understand, Rabbi, how come you are so lenient regarding Yom Kippur? He said, you choose, you choose to say that I'm being lenient regarding Yom Kippur. I am being stringent regarding saving people's lives. That's what he said. You know, sometimes when you're being strict somewhere, you're actually being lenient somewhere else. The one who thinks that he's being strict by washing his hands first, you're, you're, it's true, you're being strict by washing your hands first, but you're also being lenient. In which regard? In going to the bathroom. In health. So what we're saying here is, no, don't be strict about washing your hands. Be strict about going to the bathroom. Almost always, when you find a leniency, someone says, oh, I follow a leniency. If you really want to know that it's a true leniency, it's a halachic permitted leniency, 
you'll find that it's not really a leniency. It's actually a stringency in a different regard. For example, like I mentioned once in a halakha class, I don't remember if it was with you or with one of my other classes, this whole ridiculousness about not drinking wine touched by a Jew who's not Shomer Shabbat. Okay, so a person told me, how could you be so lenient regarding wine touched by somebody who's not Shomer Shabbat? I said, you think I'm being lenient regarding wine? I'm telling you, I'm being strict regarding a Havad Yisrael. That's what I'm being strict about. Everything has a double side to the coin. Everything yeah, is... You always have to you, see that. But, you. but if it's really just a leniency and there is nothing good about that leniency, it could be that it's not a validly halachic leniency. So you'd have to look into the sources. But you should always make sure that don't let people accuse you so quickly of following leniencies. Sometimes your leniency is really a stringency in a different area. Yeah, people don't see things that way. Very good point. They don't. Absolutely not. You have to see... Like it's like a lawyer. lawyer. You have to see they side. follow them... It's so much more comforting and... <laughs> but sure. being a robot instead of a human. That's, yeah. that's the problem. I gave my whole class today in the morning was Judaism is not Catholicism. That was my class today. It's not what I intended to teach, but it's what it came out to be. We are not a Catholic religion. We are a Jewish religion. Part of being Jewish, we're not, we don't follow the masses. We're not a, we don't have this herd mentality. We, don't, we have to think for ourselves. We have to learn for ourselves, to answer questions for ourselves. We have to be on top of the things that we do. Things have to have reasons. We have to work hard to understand our religion as much as we possibly can. That's our job. And so what if it goes against what other people are doing? Someone told me, I think it was on Shabbat, your guest. But everyone else does something else. Maybe not your guest, but somebody else's guest told me this. I said, you know, majority, minority, that's a, such a tricky game to play. Mm-hmm. The majority of the world are not Jewish. So I should become a Christian now or a Muslim? Yeah? Since when does majority decide for me how it is that I should live my life? Mm-hmm. Sure, the Torah says you should follow the majority, but the Torah gives very specific details as to which majority, who are we talking about? Everybody, the majority of the Jewish people don't keep Shabbat. So now I don't have to keep Shabbat. That's a ridiculous thing to say. Oh, but the Torah says you have to follow the major- majority. Okay. But the Torah doesn't really say that. Our rabbis understand the Torah to say when you follow the majority, you're following the majority of the Tamidei Chachamim, not the people, the Tamidei Chachamim, who decided halakha on a certain topic. What does it mean, decide the halakha? Some say that only refers to the rabbis of the Talmud. After the Talmud, you don't follow a majority minority, you follow whoever makes sense. That's the Rambam's That's opinion. Right. Wow. That's the Rambam's opinion. That's very big. Yeah, that doesn't That's mean huge. you follow everybody. You follow the rabbis in the Talmud. Who was the majority? Who was the minority? After that, I mean, it's fair game. That's now amazing. you side with whoever makes more sense. The Rambam explicitly writes this. If you look in the introduction to the Rambam that I gave you, the Rambam writes this in his introduction. By the way, we have That's an interesting I mean, problem coming up the next two Shabbats. I don't know if you're in parts of this neighborhood are going to be blacked out. Shabbat, oh, I was going to talk about that. 10 p.m. to... Let me, let me first finish this and I'm going to get to this. So comes comes also a different discussion. Not everybody who voices an opinion is really a halachic opinion. Do you know what I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Like, uh, they're not a posek. Okay, so not every rabbi who expresses an opinion is actually a posek who is qualified to express that opinion. Meaning when you say, oh, all the rabbis I know do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, but only two of them are poskim. And one says yes and one says no. So that means that 50% of the rabbis who are poskim say yes, and 50% of the rabbis you know who are poskim say no. <laughs> very know? often, very often, rabbis are not saying their own halakhic opinion. When they say to follow the majority or the minority, they're saying follow the majority or the minority of novel, chidushim, of new opinions. Not the majority of people who repeated a pre-existing opinion. So if you have 300 rabbis who are all repeating the opinion of the Rambam, that's still one opinion. That's not 300 opinions. You understand what I'm saying? And therefore, majority, minority, it's a very tricky game. It's not as simple as the world would like to say. What did you want to ask? 